Project Scheduling in Agile Environments, 10 Steps. In this session, we'll take a look at two documents, the Schedule Assessment Guide from the U.S. government. I will also take a look at another document known as the Agile Assessment Guide. Now, I'm going to put these together for you in a comprehensive way such that by the time we're done, you will have a much better idea of how to schedule in an Agile environment. So let's jump straight into a standard tool like Microsoft Project. It will amaze you that it doesn't look exactly like it did years ago. They've made considerations for scheduling in an agile environment. The way we schedule, the way we approach the work is different. This is an example of a storyboard or a Kanban board, if you will. And this is how work is moved into silos of to do, doing, and done. This is how a lot of teams get their work done. Whether you're using ClickUp, whether you're using Jira, whether you're using some other tool, it's different. Now, you can, of course, revert to a Gantt chart view, but we all know that in today's world of agile, scheduling is very different. And how we carry it out is extremely different from how it was back in the early 2000s or late 1990s. So let's examine the 10 steps that the US government has out there in this document that I talked about a few moments ago, known as the Schedule Assessment Guide. Now that information is encapsulated as follows. The first step, capture all activities. The second step, sequence all activities. The third step, assign resources to all activities. And fourth step, establish the duration of all activities. Number five, verify the schedule is traceable horizontally and vertically. Number six, confirm that the critical path is valid. Number seven, ensure reasonable total flow. Number eight, conducting a schedule risk analysis. Number nine, updating the schedule using actual progress and logic. And number 10, maintaining a baseline schedule. Now, this stuff is great. When we are in a predictive environment, all of these things have their place. But when you are in the world of agile, things flow differently. In the world of agile, my friends, we do things very differently because of this mindset of flipping the iron triangle on its head and scope becomes flexible in the world of agile as you can see the fixed components are cost and schedule so think about that for a second if the schedule is fixed in the world of agile what on earth are we doing as schedulers that's a good question to ask because the scheduling component is largely taken care of by virtue of the time box. So the way we do things in the world of Agile is so different that these 10 steps almost become obsolete. They have to be renewed and refreshed so that you're not thinking in that linear way of plan schedule management, define activities, sequence activities, estimate activity durations, develop schedule. No, 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 no. It's not like that. The reason is multifold, but let's talk about a few more reasons. Traditional oversight requires detailed artifacts at the beginning of a program, such as cost estimates, strategic plans, but agile methods advocate an incremental analysis and also when you tackle a schedule in the world of Agile, it is not done at this granular level that we do so in a lot of predictive projects. So let's cut to the chase. How do we roll in the world of Agile? There are certain things you need to understand. And the first one is the value of a vision. In Agile, we espouse the idea of having a solid vision for people to understand where exactly are we going. So we start by identifying the vision. The vision level provides a strategic view of the program goals expressed at a broad level so that the vision remains basically static and changes only infrequently. When you have an idea of the vision, we then move into higher level outcomes and goals. 
So step one is the vision, and step two is beginning to get into the granular levels. The PMI break this down in figure 6-20 of the PMBOK Guide 6th edition. And it starts off with understanding the vision. And from understanding the vision, you begin driving a product roadmap, which in it considers releases. Under the release level, we talk about the different iterations in each release. So the release plan contains a higher level plan of chunks of work that we'll be doing in iterations. Under the iteration level, we come to a concept known as a sprint plan or an iteration plan. In the iteration plan, this is where we decide which features we will release or which features we will complete at the end of each iteration. In the world of Scrum, we call it a sprint plan. Now, we do know that features contain user stories. So in each feature set, we have user stories. Under that level, this is where we begin talking about the individualized work that team members do because not everyone needs to decompose their work into hours or into tasks. So user stories are more prevalent in the world of Agile. And for that reason, you very rarely see this next component in mature teams that have already counted in their heads whether they can complete that work within an iteration. But some people still go down to the task level but a lot of teams don't. So in the world of traditional, we do things a lot in tasks, right? In the traditional world, things are broken down into tasks. But you do not necessarily need to do this in the world of Agile. In fact, a lot of mature teams won't do this. So even though you see tasks here, be aware that a lot of teams do not do this visibly. Those people doing the work do this privately. They decompose down to this level if they need to. But for the most part, a lot of teams don't. So I need you to get this understanding that in Agile, we are pursuing higher level outcomes and higher level goals. So what does that mean for you as a scheduler? In the world of Agile, we focus on the product roadmap, just like I showed you the different levels, the vision, then we get to the roadmap. So re requirements are initially expressed as high-level capabilities. Could be in a product roadmap, and they're prioritized in the backlog. We call it a product roadmap, predominantly in the world of Agile. You could call it a program roadmap if you want. Depends on what you're working on. One official in government stated that requiring these artifacts early can be challenging because it can be more worthwhile to start with a high-level cost estimate and vision or roadmap that gets updated as the solution is more refined, talking about the world of Agile now. Another thing I talked about is identifying releases. So it's one thing to do an iteration that produces some increment, but it's another thing to understand when to release those increments. Another topic to talk about in the world of Agile is deciding a cadence. Agile program cost estimates have an advantage over traditional program cost estimates because they can be regularly updated. The same token, when we talk about the cadence of the work involved, it is defined earlier on, and it's one of the things we should consider. We should also plan the iterations. As I showed you in the image, we plan what are we going to be doing at the iteration level. What are we going to be doing at the release level? So there's a kind of intentionality that is very different. It's higher level. Moving into a more specific view of a product roadmap, you can see from this example that what we're looking at tends to be more at a higher level in quarters. We look at the releases, the theme of the release, the features, and this replaces a lot of what people typically would do in project. Because it's different. We don't do things like this. Instead, 
you want to think a little bit more about a sprint planning board or a storyboard like I showed you. you could call it a sprint board but the idea is the work looks significantly different in the schedule. A lot of times we would schedule work in a product roadmap. So how do we take the concept I showed you in the very beginning and change that into a more agile way of thinking? How do we do things like validating the critical path in the world of agile? You just do it at the higher level I showed you. Epics and features are higher level chunks of work. Now, before we get lost in more minutia, let me clarify for you what exactly the economies of scale are in the world of Agile. So let's take a look at what I call a PBI breakdown, product backlog item breakdown. It's very important you understand these breakdowns in the world of Agile because we use them quite a lot. So at the very high level, we got the product. You could call that the deliverable, the ultimate goal, whatever you're trying to do. Under that, we have a big old chunk of functionality known as an epic. And an epic could be described as a large user story, if you will. But it's really more like a huge chunk of functionality. It doesn't need to be written in a story format. Under that, we have the features. What are features? When you consider what a feature is, it is really a grouping of stories that helps you in your release. Features serve to group together stories that should be released together. Okay, so two things. Epics, I like Mike Cohn's very simple definition. Think of it as a label you apply to a large story, large chunk of functionality, cannot be delivered as defined within a sprint. So it's something we need to break down. It's called an epic, all right? So we have product level, epic level, feature level. We understand that a feature has various stories in it to give that feature set. And under, you could, in some teams, actually decide to get to this task level. But again, this is not a level we dwell on in the world of Agile on a lot of teams. Because the way we estimate our work is different. We do not estimate our work in durations. We use other measures when we are estimating stories. And the way we estimate stories in the world of Agile is using a couple of methods. First of all, we use story points. And story points are not based on duration. They're based on size and complexity. A lot of teams will use planning poker. Each estimator has a deck of cards. Team chooses a small story and assigns a value. Everyone's on the same page. And then we take a story from the deck or from the backlog, and we decide, let's estimate this one. And on the count of three or whatever, the team shows their cards. And remember, these are not days. These are not hours. These are arbitrary numbers that take away the abstract, that idea of duration. So we're talking about size and complexity, predominantly. And based on this, we assign story points. Another way we can do this is using affinity estimating. And affinity estimating, we see the board, see the wall, put extra large, large, medium, small, extra small examples of user stories. And with this idea of being able to compare and contrast, whether it's bigger, smaller, same size, you've got an example of an extra small, well, you know if the story you're holding is an extra small or if it better fits small, medium, large, or extra large based on the examples you have on the wall. And we call it silent relative sizing because all you do, given a bunch of stories, each team member is given their bunch of stories, and they go around the room putting these stories where they belong. It's very rapid, very quick. You could be done with hundreds in one session, hundreds of stories in one session. And then we challenge at the end. But those are two ways we estimate. Do you see how estimating in the world of Agile is radically different? So some teams, like I said, they put these sizes on the wall. Some teams use numbers 
on the back end, so they're not revealed up front. But when all is said and done, the numbers are revealed, and then we know, okay, it's a small, so it's a two, or it's a one, and the numbers are uncovered. Teams have different ways they do this. So this is just to give you an idea that in the world of Agile, we don't do things the way we do in a predictive environment. And for that reason, when you are approaching scheduling in an Agile environment, you got to do things differently. So let me show you a set of ideas I have put together based on the great work of our friends at the U.S. government. And I have replaced a lot of the terminology with my own terminology. So taking a look at all of these steps 1 to 10, this is my breakdown of how you should think about this in the world of Agile. So step one, capture value. Value is the key thing. And during planning, you want to focus on value going into the roadmap. Remember what I told you about epics and features? This is higher levels of thinking. Number two, sequence the value. You've got to decide when to release certain types of value and when to release other kinds of value. The product owner is a role in the world of Agile. And in the world of Agile, the product owner knows what to sequence first. What should come on the scene first? We prioritize based on value. We prioritize based on a number of things. We could take risk into consideration. We could take the marketplace conditions into consideration. But the sequence, and you've got to remember, it's not at the lower level of tasks. It's at a higher level. Okay? Number three. Push versus pull. In the world of traditional, we rely on assigning resources to tasks. But in the world of agile, we use a pull mechanism. And what I mean by a pull mechanism is we pull the work to ourselves. Pushing work to people is different. It's a different mindset. When the work is pulled, it's a different mindset. When the work is pulled, you're taking ownership and you know that you can do the work and you know that that work can be decomposed as appropriate. Number four, size the time box. So whenever you're looking at work, the question is, will it fit within the time box? It takes away the need for abstract scheduling like we do in the world of traditional. Number five, verify traceability and logic. So to be horizontally traceable in the world of Agile, you want to trace at the higher levels. Does it make sense seeing how the features are sequenced, seeing how the releases are sequenced, right? To be vertically traceable, the program schedule should align with the Agile roadmap, prioritize backlog, and burn up or burn downs. Number six, check the high level critical path. What do I mean by high-level critical path? The critical path at a much higher level. Let's go there real quick, and let me remind you of how this looks in the product roadmap. Remember, in the product roadmap, we have those bars like we do in Gantt charts, but it's at a much higher level. That's what I'm talking about here. When I say check the high-level critical path, you've got to make sure that it makes sense, right? For an Agile program, the critical path is managed during iteration planning and daily stand-up meetings. We do not use the functionality as we would in MS Project, for example. Number seven, consider capacity, velocity, and the cone of uncertainty. What exactly is capacity? It's the capacity of the team to take in work. What is velocity? It's the number of story points that a team gets done within an iteration. And what is the cone of uncertainty? The cone of uncertainty is the band of possibilities that you can use to predict what happens in an agile setting. So let me show you a very quick example of the cone of uncertainty. Over here, we've got the most likely, and we've got other bands. The green will be the best, the middle is the most likely, and the one at the bottom there is the worst case. So the worst case scenario is within five sprints, for example, we'll get 200 story points done. The best case scenario is 300 story points. 
And this is a band of possibilities. But when we schedule in the world of Agile, we take these things into consideration. Moving on here to number eight, conducting a schedule risk analysis. As mentioned, even through even though iterations are time boxed, the schedule risk analysis can help provide a confidence level to the schedule's end date to determine if additional resources need to be added to deliver, and so on. But in the world of Agile, the way we analyze risk is different from the way we would in a predictive setting. Like I said, you're factoring in velocity, you're factoring in capacity again. So even in your risk analysis, you're taking all of these into account. Now, a question is, how do we deal with risk in an agile environment? And the answer is a number of ways. First of all, teams still use the concept of risk scoring when they're more advanced. We might call it something different, like a risk factor, but we could still consider probability and impact. And when we do that and we understand the risk factor for a set of risks, it's our job as people on an agile team to schedule these risk actions in. So if there are any risk actions that need to be taken to protect the project, we build those in as spikes. But that's a discussion for a different day. Let's move on to the next step. Next step here is number nine, refine the backlog and update plans. Progress updates and logic provide a realistic forecast of start and completion dates for program activities. As you go through this timeline at the much higher level, there's a lot of refinement going on. We call this refining the backlog. One of the key things that you hear about backlog refinement is we're trying to get to a more granular and complete understanding of the items to be done. So as you refine the backlog and update plans, it gets you closer to your goal. And number 10, maintain the roadmap. The roadmap and release plans in Agile become the baseline from which to measure schedule variances. Demonstrations of working software, working product, determine stakeholder and customer satisfaction. Additionally, retrospectives are conducted to capture lessons learned at the end of each release to reduce future risks. And not just at the end of each release, at the end of each iteration, or whenever it makes sense to do so, we could conduct a retrospective. And the main goal is to improve customer commitment, motivate the team, get to the desired outcome. In the world of Agile, we favor outcome over output. So my friends, in closing, step one, capture value, use a roadmap, a prioritized backlog. Step two, sequence value, use a Kanban board or something similar, use a roadmap, prioritize backlog. When we talk about push and pull, again, a Kanban board can be used. Team members can pull things to themselves. We can use team calendars to better understand when we're available, when we're not. We could size the time box by understanding the cadence. And based on that, we could build in the concepts of a prioritized backlog, release plans and roadmaps. Number five, verify traceability logic. How do you do that? At the higher levels, like the roadmap level. Kanban boards and things like that are the lower levels of doing this. Number six, check the high level critical path. Remember, we're talking about that high level epic feature release iteration mindset, not at the task level in the world of Agile. Number seven, consider capacity, velocity, and cone of uncertainty. We could use burn ups, burn downs. We could use other charts to understand how work is being done and the propensity to get work done. We could also use the concept of planning in a detailed fashion. Some people call this sprint zero. There's a lot of controversy in the agile space as far as whether it's useless, whether it should be done. But the main thing is before embarking on a schedule, take some time out to do some planning, take some time out to do your intentional planning, backlog preparation, sprint planning, story writing sessions, retrospectives, all of these will help you. They're all risk coping mechanisms. Number nine, refine the backlog and update the plans. Epics and features are included in the high level schedules. 
burn ups and burn downs can also be considered as you tweak stuff and update it. And number 10, maintain the roadmap. How do you do that? Iteration planning, prioritize backlogs, release plans, retrospective reports, and so on. There you have it, my friends. 10 ways that you can schedule in the world of Agile. And do remember, the big old Gantt chart and the 20,000 line long schedules, that's gone away. I was part of that world. Remember, I don't hate scheduling. I love scheduling. I'm a PMISP. I've also got a certification in Microsoft Project, MCTS. But when working in Agile, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing in the world of traditional. Very different. Thank you very much, my friends. If you enjoy this, hit like, subscribe, share with your friends, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.